test reactor at Chalk River, Ontario proved we had the technology, and Canada was sitting on top of some of the world's richest uranium resources. Today, the world has 374 commercial reactors. Canada, with 25 reactors completed or under construction, ranks among the top 10 nuclear power users. But the nuclear dream has soured. After Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, we know it's not so clean, not so cheap, and not so safe. But Canada remains committed to nuclear power. We have our own reactor design, the CANDU, which we've sold to five other countries. About 100,000 Canadian jobs are tied to the nuclear power business. New Brunswick has a reactor and Quebec has one too. But the heart of Canada's nuclear industry is here in Ontario, where 16 reactors generate almost half the province's electricity. That figure will rise to more than 60% over the next few years as five more reactors now under construction come on stream. The concentration of reactors in southern Ontario worries some people. It's the most densely populated part of the country. The Pickering plant just east of Toronto houses eight reactors. Four more are nearing completion just down the road at Port Darlington. Both are closer to Toronto than Chernobyl is to Kiev. And on the other side of Toronto to the northwest lies the Bruce plant, the biggest in the world, with seven operating reactors and one under construction. All three of these big plants are on the shores of the Great Lakes. Any spill or leak could contaminate the Great Lakes system, which provides 9 million Canadians with their drinking water. Nuclear power critics say there is another concern. What if there were a serious accident, say at the Pickering plant, producing a radiation cloud like the one from Chernobyl, which traveled 1,200 kilometers? Plot that distance from Pickering, and you take in not only five provinces, but all the great cities of the eastern seaboard and the American Midwest half the population of the United States and Canada. Although Canada's reactors are among the world's safest, there have been problems. Most recently, pressure tubes at Pickering ruptured suddenly, forcing a lengthy shutdown of two of the reactors there. Could southern Ontario be evacuated in the event of a major nuclear accident at Pickering? In 1979, 300,000 people were removed from the Toronto suburb of Mississauga after a train derailment threatened to send a deadly cloud of chlorine gas across the city. Emergency planners admit a nuclear accident would be more difficult to handle, especially if it happened at Pickering, which sits beside the province's busiest highway. But even in the wake of Chernobyl, they insist they could cope with such a disaster. For The Journal, I'm Doug James. In Toronto, we have a defender of nuclear power, Dr. Norman Aspen, president of the Canadian Nuclear Association. In Montreal, a critic of the industry, Dr. Gordon Edwards of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. Dr. Aspen, let me start with you. Given what Chernobyl has done to Kiev and the surrounding area, whatever the technical differences of our two systems, have we any business building reactors as close as we do to population centers in Canada? Yes, we do. I think there are good economic reasons to do it, and I don't think there are safety uh, reasons that would prevent us from doing it. Dr. Edwards, are you satisfied with the safety of our systems so close to population centers as they are? No, I'm certainly not. I believe uh, Dr. Alvin Weinberg, who's the director of the Oak Ridge Nuclear Laboratories in the States, has said uh, that these reactors should never be built close to populated centers. They should be built in remote, isolated areas, if at all. And that I firmly believe. I think it's folly to Do build them. Dr. Rasman, are you kind of covering that when you say for economic reasons it makes sense to be close to population centers, implying that for other reasons maybe further away would have been better? Oh, you could, certainly you could build them further away, and we built the Bruce reactor system up on Lake Huron. But then we see the problems that we have in getting transmission lines. But I think that, that people like Dr. Manili from the University of New Brunswick has presented papers in international forums in the last few years that have, that have said essentially that there is no chance of a meltdown in a can-do nuclear reactor. That, has, that uh, decision by Dr. Manili and his statements have not been challenged by the international nuclear scientific community. What about that, Dr. Edwards? He's saying what happened in, in the Soviet Union couldn't happen here. Well, that's simply untrue. 
the, uh, the, there was a legislative inquiry into Canadian nuclear reactors following the Three Mile Island accident, and it concluded very firmly that it is wrong to say that a catastrophic accident cannot happen in a can-do reactor, uh, that such a catastrophic accident can happen. We also had a Royal Commission of Inquiry into electric power planning in Ontario, and they said the chance of a meltdown in a can-do reactor is far greater than what the experts in the nuclear industry are predicting. I think that we have to face up to the fact that there's a strong conflict of interest between those people who are living off nuclear power and those people who have to live with the consequences. Dr. Aspen, I think he's uh, saying something to you directly there. Well, the, the uh, Dr. Manili's paper has been accepted by our Atomic Energy Control Board, and no one from those those uh, select committee hearings or from the Porter Commission has come forward and are, are, challenged Dr. Neely's statement. Let me try statement. to put the question differently. Isn't the point about an accident that it is unexpected, that it's unanticipated? That's the trouble with accidents. But you have to look at what the statements were from the Soviet Union. Their officials said that their system was safe and therefore they didn't need any of these additional safety systems. We have built our system on a different principle. We have said that anything man builds can go wrong and that, that human beings are fallible. And so we have built the system to accommodate human fallibility and the fact that, that things break down. Dr. Edwards, are you arguing that they shouldn't be at Pickering, they should be at North Bay, or they should be at where? Well, frankly, I think that if we had to do it all over again, if we had to start today, we would not build them at all because the, the economics of the nuclear industry has turned out to be financially disastrous. All right, but if you don't mind, let's stick with okay, the, that's the, fine. the decision we've made on energy. Where yeah. would you have put these things? Well, they shouldn't be put in large population centers because, as uh, Mr. Aspen has said, if the, really we do believe that humans are fallible, then we must admit that these accidents are possible, and therefore we are deliberately putting at risk the population of Metro Toronto, and yet, at the same time, these people are unable to buy insurance. Their insurance policies have an exclusion clause which says they will not be covered in the event of radioactive contamination. Dr. Aspen, in the best of all possible worlds, where would you put a nuclear reactor in Canada? I'd put it somewhere in southern Ontario where the electricity is needed. And, and why so close? For only economic reasons? I mean, if you had other considerations, well, I wouldn't think... you put it further away? Well, we've, we've tried both ways. Um, I don't think there's any, strong, uh, there's any strong scientific reason to put it close or far away. I think the, the reasons for siting are largely economic. And what do you do with the argument that we couldn't evacuate the numbers of people were there to be well, an I don't, accident? I don't think the people who look at that problem would go for evacuating people. They, if, if there were releases from the nuclear stations, they would tell people to go into their homes close the doors and close the windows and seal up their homes. What do you do with that argument, Dr. Edwards? I would just like to see uh, <laughs> anybody in the nuclear industry or out of the nuclear industry living downwind from Chernobyl and just going into their homes and closing their doors and windows and staying there for a week or so. What do you do? Where do you get your water? Where do you get your food? What do you breathe? I think it's just folly. Dr. To Aspen? Well, we're not dealing with with uh, the Russian situation. We're dealing with a very different situation where you have a containment building and a vacuum building. And uh, we have... We Doc, have Dr. Aspen, let me ask you just on that point, because I think that a, a Soviet ambassador in Western Europe has conceded that the incident at Chernobyl began with an explosion. Are you saying an explosion isn't conceivable in the Canadian system? Well, you can't have a nuclear explosion in, in a reactor uh, unless it's it's producing uh, plutonium or something okay. that gets a critical... Dr. Edwards? Uh, we're not talking about nuclear explosions. We're talking so you're about talking about leaks, and he's saying he can contain leaks. We're talking about plain old hydrogen gas explosions. In 1952, there was an accident at Chalk River, which was accompanied by a series of hydrogen gas explosions. And similar things could happen at the Kandu reactors at Pickering. Okay, and, I've got five seconds left, and I'd like to make sure Dr. Aspen answers that point. Okay, fine. Five seconds only, sir, I'm sorry. Well, I think those accidents are, are not going to happen. They're not within the realm of credibility. All right. We thank you both. Thank you.